My name is John Cheptevich, Director of Scouting for the PBC. And joining me today is 2020 NBA Draft Early Entrant, Milan Aqua. What's going on, Milan? What's going on? How you doing? Hey, doing pretty well, man. Uh, you know, I, I think it's got to be an exciting time for you now that we're only about a month out from the draft, right? It's been kind of dragging along forever with this pre-draft process for you. Are you excited to finally be uh, turning the corner here and headed toward a definitive draft date? Uh, definitely. It's been a tricky year, so any any progress forward is, you know, good for me right now. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a great experience, and, you know, I'm looking forward to what, what comes next. Appreciate yeah. you having me on the show. Yeah, of course, man. Um, so I track all the early entrance stuff really closely, right? And so I saw your name in the pool originally, and all these guys are typically all over social media making some uh, super dramatic statement about, like, <laughs> choosing to keep their name in the draft or whatever or get confirmed that people are staying in versus testing the water. And your name was probably the very last one that I got any confirmation on because I feel like you're a kind of seem to be a kind of chill, laid back, low key guy that's not trying to make a like a spectacle out of anything. So eventually, you know, I think it maybe surprised some people, but not others that you ended up keeping your name in. Do you want to maybe uh, quickly talk me through your decision to ultimately keep your name in the draft? Um, yeah, it was a pretty long decision because yeah. um, the pandemic and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I just decided that <clears throat> I felt like I did all that I, I could do at CVU, um, yeah. being that they couldn't go to the tournament or play, I mean, possibly not play non-conference games this year. Right. So I didn't want to risk that. Um, I don't want to risk going back and, and, you know, having another year and, you know, being almost in the same position, although we would have had opportunity to work out and everything next year. I just felt, you know, more comfortable this year and felt like this this year was my time to go. Um, so I felt ready. So um, I was confident and I felt at peace about going. So that was the decision that I made. Yeah. No, I think that's a really smart, mature way to look at it and approach it. I mean, you were your conference's player of the year. And then all these other, you know, reasons of uncertainty or, you know, lack of a real way to show more than what you've already shown. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, keeping your name in the draft would actually be beneficial to a lot of other guys who are juniors kind of trying to make that decision. But oftentimes it's easier to just make that decision to come back to school where you're comfortable and, you right. know, but uh, hashtag unfinished business and uh, social media post or whatever it is, right? But it, I think that you seem to have taken a really uh, calculated, smart, mature approach to this. And I think that this is a good decision for you. So um, definitely wishing you the best of luck here in this final month leading up to the draft. And just wanted to do something a little bit different here since it's been such an elongated pre-draft process. And kind of go through your clips, what you bring to the table that could translate nicely to the pros, maybe a couple minor improvement areas that if you tweak mm -hmm. them, it can really, you know, help progress your game forward as you begin your pro career. Yeah, I appreciate you. And and for sure, I'm looking forward to look, getting into the film with you. All right, let's do it, man. So we're going to start on the offensive side of the ball. And what really stuck out to me was that you're super dynamic in isolation situation. So this was one of your most efficient play types uh, relative to the rest of college basketball um, this past season. And you have a really good, uh, you know, kind of way of falling out to sleep and then bursting right past them and then using your body and contorting your body in the air for acrobatic finishes. So we're going to run through a few of these clips and kind of get your perspective on that. Okay. So we'll see this first one here. You just give this guy a hesitation, and then this is a crazy finish where you're hanging in the air. You want to maybe just, you know, when you're getting to this point right here, uh, you want to talk me through maybe, like, what you're seeing defensively. you got, got a guy at the foul line right here that might be able to help, but you seem not to be deterred by that, right? What is your sort of uh, approach when you're breaking this down off the dribble? Uh, right here, um, we're clearing out this side. So it's really an ISO play. Yeah. Kind of going to my left hand. Mm -hmm. um so my teammate ended up clearing i knew his defender wasn't going to stay there if he stayed right. that'd be an easy shot for him or or two on one on the weak side so um as soon as i saw him vacate i 
started to um, attack uh, the defender. And I saw that he was on his heels. Um, so I knew that if I gave him a hesitation, he'd have to respect it because I obviously was thinking shot at that time, uh -huh. um, being down three. So yep. um, I gave him a hesitation. He put his hands up. I saw he froze a little bit, so I was able to get yep. by him. And um, the help side came. Um, probably had a couple weak side passes that I could have made, but I just felt like I had to finish at that time with the, the score being what it was. So, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you really, like you said, you get this guy on his heels, and if we pause it right here, he's in no position to guard you at that point, right? He's super off balance. You already have a you know, head of speed going toward the rim. And this help side guy does come, like you mentioned, but I feel like, you know, you're just like a really elite finisher at absorbing body contact and almost creating space in the air by bumping into guys and then still having that hang and finishing. Is that something that you feel has always been a part of your game or have you kind of gained further explosiveness throughout your career to be able to pull this off? Um, no, when I was, when I was younger, I was a guy that liked to attack the basket a lot. So I had to find ways um, with my size to be able to finish um, at the basket. So um, strength is something that is, is just, <clears throat> I use a lot in my game. So using my shoulder to be able to create that contact or either, either get a foul or um, just try to finish through the defender's chest is something that I've always had to do. And, you know, hopefully I can continue to get better at that. Definitely. Um, and then we'll see, you know, that's one way of creating space in the air. But I think you have to do a nice job of creating space with dribble moves like this and kind of using your body to shake people off of you for pull-ups, right? So this one, uh, we'll see that this is in the same game, right? Just a little bit later in overtime on this one. You start attacking this guy off the bounce, and he actually has pretty good position here at this point, right? Like he's not in a bad spot. He's got uh, number 11 and help side right here. Uh, but you – like kind of recognize the situation and are able to swing that thing back and hit a little floater. Uh, so do you want to maybe talk me through this one and kind of what you're seeing as you start getting downhill right here? Yeah, like you were saying, um, I saw that everybody really stayed home on this play. Um, we didn't really we didn't really run much. I just felt at this time we needed a we needed a basket. Um, the game was very close, and I knew that at this time I, I felt like we had I had to take the game over and try to, yeah. you know, get us a bucket at any, any way possible. So um, I just tried to get that defender to, you know, get off balance. And I saw that, I saw that um, once I got into that, the, the paint area a little bit, that he was leaning a little bit. So I knew that I could stop um, quickly and I'd either have a shot or some type of pass or look. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, you do just a great job of kind of, you know, leveraging the situation and getting the best look that you can. And like you said, it's like it's time. It's late in the game. Kind of got, got to put the team on your back. And if we just play this right here, it's pretty crazy how far back he flies there when you whip that behind your back. Real quick. He goes from the last logo the whole way down to the block. So um, really nice move, really crisp handle there and another clutch play by you again. I, I think it's we got we got to start, you know, this whole entire series of clips all from this game because, like you said, you absolutely took over. So we got the game winner here as well. Uh, so you're ISO'd again. This is just straight one on one ball, right? But what I guess down by one, it's not like it's even tied, right? When it's tied, you kind of have a little bit more freedom here to do what you want. But down by one is really tricky tough situation as uh, clutch as it can get what's going through your mind here with five or so seconds on the clock breaking him down off the dribble uh well, right here they got this they i ended up um calling dejan up he um set a pick and we got the switch so yeah. there was a mismatch both ways i felt like um but being the player that i am and and i love playing in these situations i um felt like i needed to get the shot off so I went to a, a move that I work on a lot. Um, so I tried to, you know, fill out the defense by attacking him a little bit. Um, yeah. I saw that he was on his heels again, just like the, the defender we saw in the first clip. So I used the, the left-hand hesitation. Um, he, he bit a little bit, but not 
to where I could get all the way by him. So I felt right. like I needed to get some type of shot up and get some type of separation. So um, I lowered my shoulder a little bit and, you know, did a step back and then that was the game. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's about as clutch as it can get. You took over in overtime and, you know, this step back, I mean, you love getting to the hole, right? But like having this step back in your bag as a counter for when guys do actually cut you off is huge. And I feel like you've definitely made some improvements in that area uh, throughout the season. Thank you. So now we'll move on uh, to the next clip here. We're finally out of the Seattle game and the, the overtime takeover. Now, what we're going to go through on this one, I think, is, again, your ability to create separation and kind of use your body to bump people off their spots. So right here, this guy is, you know, picking you up three-quarters court, like trying to give you some hits. I'm sure, you know, early in the game against teams, you know, they know that you're the guy to try to kind of uh, get under your skin and irritate you a little bit. Uh, did you face a lot of this throughout the year uh, with you being the focal point of the offense? And, uh, you know, what do you think is the best way to counter this type of, like, aggressive defense? Um, well, I think that it, you know, there's different ways to counter it. Um, you know, you can get your, your teammates involved and you can – get right into the offense. And I think sometimes the only way to counter, you know, aggressive pressure like this is to attack it. Um, yeah. So on this play, I, I felt like I, I, I was going to uh, get us into offense initially, but then I, when I saw mm -hmm. that I had an angle on him and then I, I pushed the ball and, and was able to stop on a dime and he, you know, back, kept backing up and gave me the separation. So I, I felt like there was no need to pass up that shot at that time. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, I just saw that he was up too high, tried to attack him to get us into offense initially, and then, you know, was able to get the separation and felt like it was a, a, a good shot for me. So, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just a really good job of combating pressure here, good handle under pressure, and then you send him on skates again. Like, you send him flying six feet past you and pull up on a dime. So, you know, this kind of ability to hit shots off the dribble and create space is kind of a like a premium skill at the next level to be able to create your own shot like this under pressure. So I think that's definitely something that translates nicely to the next level. And again here, uh, this one's driving to the hole again, but just wanted to highlight again on this one. I think you're a pretty creative finisher going to the left, and we'll see you send this guy flying again from <laughs> – middle of the paint the whole way back under the hoop just by being aggressive right so you're kind of like a bowling ball you know once you get into the paint right there and that's really hard for uh for teams to defend if you're assertive and aggressive like that yeah so now one other thing that we wanted to touch on after one more crazy finish right here is that you know the ability to put the pressure on defense like this and get to your spots right uh, it also leads to some opportunities uh, for you to use your vision and your passing, right? So you're a guy who averaged, what, like almost six assists per game this year? Um, yeah, I think around there. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of your passing is opportunities like this, right, where you're able to really put pressure on the defense, draw some help here, and then kind of keep your head up uh, for skip passes and look out on the perimeter, right? So. Uh, do you want to maybe just speak to your ability to, you know, be aggressive as a driver, but still kind of keep your head up and maintain that vision to the weak side and kick out the shooter? Yeah. Um, so I think the the most the most important part of um, you know being an offensive threat is getting into the middle and the teeth of the, of the defense. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I try to do is put pressure on the defense and try to get into that paint, get into the middle, to where. They have to rotate and, you know, make decisions. Right. Um, so that's something that they did here. I saw that the, the guy on the weak side was coming to cover down the big. Um, if he doesn't come, that's a wide open dunk for him. So right. I saw he came down. And then uh, Farron, who's a great shooter, um, happened to be wide open because his man left him. Yep. So um, I threw him the ball and he hit it. Right, and that's like very quick split-second decision-making, right? Because right at this time right here, firstly, like you could have tried to, you know, rush up a floater or something. And secondly, this big down on the block that you referred to, 
you know, if you just pause it like this, it looks like he's open. But like you said, this guy's tagging down on him. And so if you try to put that over there, that might get deflected out of bounds or, you know, be a tough catch or something like that. So the decision making in very, uh, you know, minimal windows like this to make the right read and hit your teammate right there that's definitely going to translate to the next level, especially when you're surrounded by even more dynamic shooting threats out on the perimeter, right? Yeah. So we'll see another one right here where, you know, you you start with a little pick and roll action, which gets blown up a little bit on this one, right? But then you just start attacking the baseline. Uh, When you attack baseline like this, what are you sort of anticipating at this point? Is it a kind of similar read where – uh, you see all five guys have their feet in the paint and you kind of know that weak side uh, might be open for a skip or what, what's your kind of outlook when you're putting pressure on on the baseline here? Um, this one, like you said, the, the pick and roll got blown up. So I, I started attacking um, the defender that was guarding me here is a little, little bit smaller. So right. I really was looking to go post up in this play. Yeah, um, and then the big ended up coming over to like double team me. I guess their scheme was to double team when I when I got in the post. Right. So um, I saw that they, you know, the big left his man. So either the weak side would have to cover down, or the corner guy would have to cover down, cover right. uh, come over. So um, in this in this instance, the corner guy ended up coming over to take that big, and then I saw saw uh, Farron in the corner again for a wide open shot. Yeah, exactly, right? And so understanding understanding the defensive side of the ball and like what uh, you know the typical ro- rotation scheme is as far as the opposing team's defensive concept is key for you and like making these reads and anticipating. And I think you have a really high IQ in these situations. And this isn't this isn't an easy pass to make right here either, right? Like you, you know, you're right underneath the rim. He's floating a little bit uh, to the corner, but you're able to zip it over the defender that's crashing down on you for a nice look again. So uh, I think that you just do a really nice job keeping your head up with these skips. And then this one, we're going to do um, a little pick and roll action again, but you get the you get a switch, but it seems that they come and run and double at you, right? So what's your... I would imagine that throughout the year, a lot of teams would kind of hard head or blitz you on the pick and roll to try to make it tough and get the ball out of your hands. So yeah. when you see this situation happening right here, what is sort of your read and what are you anticipating the defense to do and how they might rotate uh, once both these guys come at you? Um, the big ended up, the big ended up staying. So mm-hmm. coming off that pick and roll. So um, it was kind of like a double team, like you said, um, and I see the big um, slipping down the paint wide open. Yeah. So I give him a hard look. I'm really trying to throw him the ball, and I'm reading this this backline defender on the weak side. Um, right. On the block. Um, so he ends up seeing that I'm about to throw the big the ball, and he comes all the way over. So I, I see the skip pass wide open over there. Yep, and that's just really good – uh, feel for like manipulating defense with your eyes, right? Like, uh, you know, you really sell it right here, right? You have the ball up in the air. You're looking right at the guy on the foul line. To his credit, he's doing a great job of, you know, getting his hands up in the air, making himself available. Uh, do you want to maybe just speak to like the extent with which like, you know, using your eyes and really selling these types of passes can open up uh, passing angles when you're reading weak side guys like this? No, the, re, uh, using your eyes is is definitely a important key um, because you know sometimes if you use your eyes and maybe um, act like you're gonna throw it to so maybe if I would have not jumped up in the air and 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 act like I was throwing it to the weak side skip maybe that the the backline defender vacates and I you know the big has a second look down the middle wide open so um, you know using your eyes and just trying to um, confuse the defense and manipulate the defense, like you said, is very important. Yeah, it's huge. And it's like, it's tough to be able to, you know, execute something as intricate as that while you're facing the pressure of an imminent double team out on the perimeter like this. So just a really good job of keeping cool, calm, and collected under pressure, making the right read and manipulating the defense there. 
And obviously, you know, uh, the NBA and any pro league really like it's pretty heavy in pick and roll for your ability to, you know, make those type of reads and put the pressure on as a driver that we were looking at earlier. You know, that's super valuable within any offensive system. So that's one of your strengths on the offensive side of the ball. And now one quick improvement area that we're going to hit on. Um, I think that generally uh, people might say shooting, but I'm, I'm, I'm not as, you know, I'm not that down on your shooting. Like I think that there's, uh, you know, stuff to be encouraged about, right? Like you've shot about 84, 85% from the free throw line the last couple of years. Sure. The three point percentage went down a little bit from 37 to 32 ish this year, but I don't think it's a matter of you not being a good shooter. I think it's that, you know, some of the context of the shots that you're taking, right? Like you are the guy that, you know, makes the engine run for your team and you're often uh, taking some difficult looks in that context, right? So one thing that we're going to quickly hit on here is that uh, sometimes really early in the shot clock, you can pull up for some pretty deep or difficult threes in transition. Um, and I think that, just kind of tampers your efficiency a little bit, right? Like you're pretty efficient in the half court overall, but like in transition, I think you're, uh, you know, in the bottom fifth as far as uh, points per possession. And sometimes that's from putting up some difficult looks early in the shot clock. So I'm gonna quickly just touch on these and run through them. Uh, this one, you get a steal out on the perimeter, right? You're coming down one-on-one. -on -one and you end up pulling this thing from 25 feet away, right? Uh, and maybe, I, I, I mean, uh, this is early in the second half. You guys are down six. Maybe you're trying to, like, you know, make a quick impact here off the bat. End up missing this thing. To your credit, you follow it up, get the rebound and score, right? So ultimately, not a bad result when it's all said and done and you kind of give that second effort. But do you think that this, like, first shot here – uh, it's the best shot you could have taken in this situation? Or like, do you think maybe it'd be more advantageous for you to, you know, take advantage of that strength we talked about earlier and getting your head down, maybe getting to the line or drawing some contact and getting into the sky? Definitely. No, I think that that's a terrible read when I'm, you know, I've seen this play numerous times, but I think <laughs> that that's a bad read um, just because I thought that, you know, he would keep backing up. Yeah. Um, so that was the reason that I shot it, but definitely you should have, continue to attack him and, you know, put pressure on him and make him, you know, have to make a decision on um, if he was going to foul or just go straight up and, and contest. But I definitely think that that was a bad read and, you know, wish I could get that play back. Yeah. And you still made the most of it. So, you know, good result when it's all said and done. And it seems like you're kind of aware and you've seen this in film study already. Right. Uh, and we'll see a couple of these next few clips here. This one's just early in the shot clock in the half court. So uh, is this just a matter of he's sagging off you too far and just might as well pull it? Or what, what, what do you think on this one? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that this is uh, too early in the shot clock to shoot this shot. Um, in my head, I'm confident in my shooting. And, you yes. know, in, in my opinion, he was just backed up too far. So um, that's definitely something that I have to work on is just, you know, Knowing, knowing when to shoot shots and knowing when to get into offense and, you know, run the team. Yeah, and, like, it's not a terrible shot, but, you know, maybe if you just run the offense there, you end up getting an even better look later in the possession, right? Yeah. Similar, right. similar with this one. This one's, like, early early in the game. Uh, you know, your guy comes up to set you a high screen. This is from 27 feet away, early shot clock. I know you can hit those type of shots, but again, it's just, you know, maybe you can get a better look later in the shot clock, right? Definitely. So that's just one uh, one potential improvement area uh, on the offensive end that I think, you know, you can shoot the ball, but if you just eliminate maybe one or two kind of forced tough looks per game, that'll just really up your efficiency overall, right? Right. I agree with you. Cool. So now we're going to move to the defensive side of the ball. And I think you can be a pretty active pest uh, out on the perimeter as far as like um, getting up in people's shirts and making stuff happen and making some impact plays, jumping past the lanes and things like that. So we're going to start with this one here. Uh, you're pressuring this guy up near half floor. You're down by 10 with five minutes to go. You want to maybe just speak to your ability to lock in as an on-ball defender 
kind of, you know, read and react to the offensive player to pick their pocket and make things happen for your team? Um, yeah, that's definitely something I take pride in is um, on-ball defense and, you know, just trying not to let my man score. Um, something that I think that I, I need to improve on is just knowing when to keep a guy in front and, you know, um, maybe they give me the ball instead of being so aggressive all the time. Sure. Um, but on this play, I just happen to be able to get a steal. I'm being aggressive because we're down and just was able to um, get him to mishandle the ball and get the steal on this play. Yeah, definitely. So I think we'll see that that consistently, like, you do a good job of getting up and people making them uh, uncomfortable. It's not just the on-ball stuff, right? Like, here you're giving this guy some pressure. He hit hits the guy at the elbow, and they're kind of running, you know, maybe a handoff, maybe not. But you're able to get your hand in there uh, and knock that thing out. Uh, do you think that you have a good feel for – when big guys get the ball, whether it's on the block and digging down or situations like this where you're passing through and have a split second to kind of jump in and help and dig, uh, do you think that that's something that, uh, you know, you could continue to add value at the next level as far as, like, taking advantage of bigs who are uncomfortable with the ball in their hands or not maybe aware of what's happening around them? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of bigs tend to – you know, it depends on their skill level and obviously, sure. but um, when they get the ball, they, they tend to relax and, you know, some, some don't really look where the help side defense will be or where a yes. double will be coming from. So that's something that I, I try to, you know, whenever a big gets the ball or brings it, brings it low, I try to make sure that I was taught not to let a big bring the ball back up when they bring it down. So yes. Um, that's something that I try to, you know, instill and, and make sure that I put pressure on bigs and, you know, just just uh, offensive players in general throughout the game. And and maybe you only get, you know, one steal like this in a given game, right? But, you know, probably the whole rest of the second half when this guy's catching the ball, he's a little bit more hesitant, a little bit more, you know, protective of the ball. And maybe he that causes him to, you know, miss a wide open pass the next time because he's hesitating or worried about you getting in there and making something happen right so it's not just you know getting a steal here or there like this it's just the you know the pressure and uh making the offense uncomfortable throughout the rest of the game and knowing that you know you're going to get in there and make things difficult for them that they have to be on their toes right yeah definitely so we'll get uh over to this play here so they make a skip pass you know, you kind of try to jump it. He catches it in the corner. And, again, I think he just relaxes for a second because you miss – you know, you try to deflect this and miss this first one. But you stay ultra aggressive and you catch him sleeping here, right? Like he's holding the ball over his head like this. You just get your hand in there and knock it out. Uh, do you think that you have a good sort of just level of consistent engagement defensively that, you know – when guys are caught sleeping that you just, you know, have quick enough hands to make things happen like this? Like what, how would you generally describe your overall mentality to being engaged so much on the defensive end? Because I know as a guy who's a prominent on ball scorer, you know, you use up a lot of your energy on the offensive side of the ball, like having to make everything happen for your team. How do you stay locked in defensively and make these type of plays with, the offensive load that you have to bear? Um, yeah, last year, something that I really wanted to improve on was um, my defense and not just not just on ball, but staying alert off the ball as well. Um, so that was why you see me, you know, try to jump and get that steal um, when they pass it um, right. the first time. So I'm just trying to stay active off the ball. And something that I've always liked to do was, you know, try to get steals too, because I know that that can lead to a scoring. But this year, um, and being at CVU, I realized the importance of defense and the importance of, you know, locking down a team like with with real team defense and you know just yeah. keeping guys in front, and making thing, making everything tough. So, um, yeah, getting steals is something that I, you know, have a knack for and love to do. But um, I've grown to love um, just being able to to lock a team up, and you know, if you're not scoring and the other team's not scoring. Um, I feel like that, that it, give, it it evens the playing field and allows you to, 
put you in position to win every game if you play great defense. So that's something right. that I, you know, tried to improve on last year. And, you know, you see it here in this play. Yep. Just remaining engaged at all times. Like it's, it's uh, an underrated skill. It's, you know, it's not always going to be the steals like this, but, you know, just staying at home, staying alert over the long run, even if your shot's not falling, just remaining consistently engaged on defense, you can still add value uh, no matter what if you uh, stay locked in like that. Exactly. Um, and something else I think you do a pretty good job of is uh, closing out on shooters, right? So uh, we're going to see in this play right here, there's a little bit of a pick and roll action and you're on the weak side wing ball coming toward you here. This guy's pretty deep out, uh, you know, well beyond NBA range, but you still get a great hand and great contest right here. Uh, and then I think we'll see something similar in this one. But this one, there's a little bit more to it because you're kind of helping at the nail to start on this pick and roll, right? Right. Uh, so when you're only one pass away like this and there's a pick and roll coming straight toward you, how do you kind of – uh, do the job of balancing, like helping out your guy at the nail like this, and then also staying attached and being able to like jump out and close out on a shooter. Uh, still maintain a discipline close out. Um, well, that that all depends with personnel and who you're guarding, obviously. Yeah. Um, but this guy, the guy that's bringing the ball up, he loves to get downhill, loves to yeah. put pressure on the defense, and loves to get in the paint. So I knew that um, – as this pick was coming, he would definitely try to get in the paint. So yeah. I tried to plug, tried to plug the hole as best as possible. And when he ended up passing it, um, I tried to make the pass pretty hard. Yeah. Um, and so I saw that he was, you know, getting ready to shoot. And, you know, something that CBU worked on a lot was our closeout. So we put a lot of time into that. Um, so I just tried to make the shot as tough as possible without fouling. Um, you know, and if he makes that shot, that's a great shot. Kudos yeah. to him. But that's I feel like that's a difficult shot to, you know, make. Yeah, absolutely. And like you were saying, like you plug this, but then you almost get your hand on this ball, right? Like you, you make this pass as difficult as possible, but you're not, you know, you're not losing your focus or losing your discipline and trying to like just totally jump this out toward half court, right? Like you're right. – you're kind of moving diagonally out toward the shooter, getting a hand in the passing lane and already moving your body in that direction so you can close out really quickly. So, I mean, that's, you know, a pretty specific play here and like very minor sort of nuances of defense. But I just think this collective clip here as a whole really embodies, uh, you know, some of the subtle things that you can do on defense, both from like a – you know, team defensive, uh, you know, help perspective and a recovery to shooters perspective. Definitely. So now we're going to see, uh, now we're just going to focus on potential de defensive improvement areas. So we spoke a little bit about how, like, you can be a pest on the ball. You are pretty consistently engaged and you can help and recover to shooters. The minor thing that we're going to just quickly touch on is, uh, you know, teams might try to put you in a lot of pick and roll. Like how we said, the NBA is a, you know, pick and roll heavy league, and you'll probably have a bunch of giant dudes coming and setting screens on you, right? And so the one thing we're going to touch on is fighting through ball screens. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see on this one right here, uh, this guy just starts getting downhill, and this isn't entirely on you, right? Like your big probably needs to hedge a little bit better for you to recover here. Um, but this second one here – is more of like a uh, he denies the pick and roll, right? So, do you think on this one, maybe is this like a footwork thing, or uh, how do you think that you could have better contained this guy when he ends up kind of uh, going away from the ball screen that's coming towards uh, towards him? Um, yeah, I think that's definitely a footwork thing, but you know, I think that that's also a miscommunication thing. I, yeah. I, I believe that on this play, we're supposed to be, I, I think we're supposed to be switching on this play. So I would say that yeah. this is a footwork play. Um, I should force him to the screen instead of letting him um, get downhill to the left. Usually, usually we're, we're icing the screen or forcing right. the, the ball to the, the offensive players we can. So that's probably where the confusion was. I probably thought that I was supposed to be forcing it to the left. Um, but 
it looks like we're, we should be switching that place. So that's definitely a footwork thing and a, and a miscommunication thing. And that's something that I have to be more focused on. And especially at this time, going into halftime, can't give up easy points like that. Right, exactly. So I, I think what you just described there kind of helps eliminate what happened, right? Because you're, you're positioned almost like you're trying to ice some stars with your uh, butt to the screener and kind of forcing them toward uh, the sideline or baseline, right? But then at the last second, you end up kind of like switching your feet the other direction as if you were going to put them toward the screen. And he just takes that split second to take advantage of you flipping your hips and flipping your feet there to get to the rim. So, uh, yeah, I think exactly what you said, just kind of a miscommunication type thing. Uh, and then this one, I think you get caught up and then, uh, you know, the screen's coming, you get caught up on it. But I think you, you maybe could have recovered on this one, right? Uh, but end up kind of trailing and then stopping here uh, at the free throw line. Do you think that uh, you could have maybe fought over this one a little bit better in this instance? Um, to be honest, I believe that we're either switching or or sending that to the weak side also. So I feel like, you know, on that play, we just have to do a better job as a team, um, you know, stopping the ball. He was able to get around the big on that play, which didn't give me any time to, you know, be able to recover. But I definitely could have taken a better angle on this play is what I would say. Yeah. Um, being that this player is not a great shooter, I could have gone under the screen instead of trying to fight over and get right. hit by the screen and causing any type of, you know, um, rotation at all. So if yeah. I would have gone under, I would have just been able to stay in front and get back in front. But I took yeah. a bad angle um, and went over on a non-shooter, um, which allowed him to get downhill. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes it's as simple as, you know, the over under decision can make all the difference. And then this one, uh, I, I think they probably throw you guys into a little bit of a loop here by setting like, uh, almost like a ghost screen action here, right? Like you yeah, come yeah. up and you set in it and then pops on through like this. Did this kind of just muck up your guys communication on a switch stay type decision or like what, what ended up happening on this one? Yeah, we actually went over this a lot in practice before this game. So, this is very uh, irritating that we, we didn't get it down in the game. But um, on this play, they're, they're setting a, a guard to guard screen, which would be an easy switch call. And, you know, we just switch defenders. And being that we're both guards, we just switch. But um, we miscommunicate somehow, and he ends up getting downhill to his right hand. Um, but on this play, we we're definitely supposed to be just switching and, and, you know, um, keeping the ball in front, but you know, we let them get downhill and, you know, that's on us for not communicating. Right. So what, I, I guess, uh, when a team does like a guard to guard screen action like that at the top, but, uh, the guy actually just ends up running through and go screening it. Uh, what is, what is your coaching staff sort of teach you to do in that situation? Like if he doesn't actually make contact or set the screen and kind of just slips throughout to the opposite wing, uh, what are you and uh, your teammates supposed to do in that situation as far as a switch stay decision there? Um, usually we're, we're taught to um, call out switch stay. So like um, force the defender towards the screen, obviously to be able to, put ourselves in a position to get the switch. And then if they don't set the screen, we're supposed to yell out, stay. Right. Um, that, kind of that, that, second call. Yeah. I mean, that was just a bad, you know, job of communicating, like I said, and, you know, we prepared for that, but we're definitely supposed to uh, call out like switch. And then if he doesn't end up setting the screen, we call out stay at the last second, but right. uh, it was just too late at that time. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, those clips were kind of like, pretty nitpicky, right? But I think that ultimately what comes out of it is that like defense and especially with pick and rolls, it's all about communication and being on the same page as your teammates. So like, you know, you seem like a really smart, like, you know, a smart guy that understands, you know, team defense who will be a good communicator and everything. So uh, you're going to get run through a lot of pick and rolls when you start your pro career. So just making sure that, you know, you and your teammates are on the same page and maybe stepping up in practice and kind of, uh, you know, taking control of that as the point guard and the leader in whatever situation you're in, whether that's 
you know, someone coming off the bench or someone starting in the G League or whatever it is, just kind of taking pride in being a vocal leader on defense and, you know, making sure that your team is buttoned up in these pick and rolls, I think would be a good way for you to add value defensively at the next level as well. Definitely. Definitely. Being vocal is something that's very key and something that I worked on a lot last year. So um, hopefully I can take that to the next level with me. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, that's all I've got clip wise. So I really enjoyed like digging into your film and I'm sure that, uh, you know, a lot of teams may not have necessarily at the beginning of the year thought that you would be an early entrant in the draft. Right. But you came out, proved everything that you could, like we discussed before, one year conference player of the year. And now during this elongated pre-draft process, I'm sure a lot of them are, you know, catching up on your film after you decided to keep your name in the draft. So, uh, you know, definitely wishing you the best of luck going forward. But before we uh, wrap things up here, wanted to kick it over to you and just give you the chance to speak directly to these teams and just let them know who is Milan Aqua and if they are to bring you into their organization, what can they expect from you both on and off the court? Um, on the court, you can expect a, uh, a winner, somebody who loves to win, loves to compete, um, very aggressive um, offensively and defensively, um, and somebody who just loves the game. Um, and then off the court, you can, you know, expect the guys laid back, um, easy going, um, very faith filled, um, and, you know, just excited to be able to play and continue to grow as a person and as a, um, a player. Awesome, man. That, that sounds like something that any team would sign out for. Plus you have one of the coolest names uh, in the draft class. So that's always a plus. Uh, but no, honestly, uh, I think you had a hell of a college career. And I think well, like we were talking about earlier, it was a good decision for you uh, to begin your career in light of all the uncertainty surrounding next season in college basketball and what you've accomplished so far. I think it was a smart move and uh, absolutely going to be, you know, watching your career unfold as you begin your rookie season here soon and wishing you the best of luck, man. I appreciate you. Like, like I said earlier, I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, it was good talking to you. Thank you for taking the time. Yes, sir. Thank you for joining. Stay safe. You too.